Good evening, everyone, and horrific holidays. Welcome to Back to Ashes. Tonight, I will be reading Christmas horror stories for your listening pleasure. Tuck in, get warm, and let's get started, shall we? Staring at the tree, whiskey in hand, Pete was pleased that this year would be different from the last. It had been the strangest time of his life, but he truly felt like things were finally coming together. And when better to come together than at Christmas, a time he loved more than any other. In some ways, the past year had been like an eternity, and others as if it had succumbed to time in the blink of an eye. But either way, he was glad to see the back of it. Staring at the Christmas tree, its beautiful lights casting a warm hue over the room, and the snow quietly falling outside as the sun set, Pete began to think of the past year, of his daughter Lena and his wife Janet. It had started with a very normal December, twelve months earlier. The small town in which they lived was covered in a thick layer of snow, the residents spending most of their days clearing driveways and Pete's wife going off for one of her usual wonders. She had been gone for a couple of hours, but while Janet was utterly devoted to her family, she still needed moments to herself to clear her head, to diminish the stress that comes with a loving yet disorganized husband and a little girl who was kind, but who enjoyed trying her parents' patience as much as possible. When the tensions of a domestic life clouded her feelings, or began to weigh on her spirit. Janet would wander out of the back door into the fields and woodlands which characterized the entire area and trek for a little while through the pines which dotted the landscape. It therefore wasn't unusual for her to be gone for fairly long periods, especially since it was around that time of year when she could take it upon herself to choose the Christmas tree, no matter how much Pete or Elena asked to help out. This was Janet's job. She loved the tradition of it, the process of choosing the best possible tree, cutting it down, and then seeing the bright smiles on her family's faces as they would gleefully take the tree indoors and decorate it with sparkling glitter garlands, warm glowing lights, and an array of festive baubles. It was a small highland town where they lived, far away from any major city, but Janet and the rest of her family loved their home the simplicity of it, the feeling of being an integral part of a close-knit community, and of course, the beautiful surroundings, lush during the Scottish summer and cold, crisp start, but yet awe-inspiring in the winter. Most importantly, she loved the pine woods nearby, specifically a collection of trees which sat at the top of a small hill within walking distance from the house, perfect for picking a Christmas tree. She would return there each year, and while their numbers thinned due to a few other neighbors going there for the exact same purpose, there were enough trees to last a good many years. When she had been gone for three hours, Pete began to grow nervous, as this was longer than usual, and since it was getting dark, he took it upon himself to venture outside, telling Lena to lock the doors after him, and that he would not be long. Lena laughed when he told her that. He expected that Mommy was struggling through the snow with a huge tree, bigger than any other they had ever had. Peter loved to see the excitement in his daughter's face at this time of year, and he told her to watch from her bedroom window to see what they would bring back. With this, she excitedly ran up the stairs straight to her window before he had to call her back down to lock the door. Gazing at the beautiful tree, He could remember that night like it was yesterday. The snow was crisp on the ground and crunched under his feet as it began to freeze. Small flakes fell from the sky occasionally, but Janet's footprints remained uncovered. Even without them, Peter knew where they were heading. The hill where Janet returned each year was only a 40-minute hike away. She would pick a pine tree from there. In fact, sometimes she picked two one around six foot, the other a young tree about half the size, if they could find one suitable. It was difficult at times to find smaller trees as they seemed to be rare in that area, 
Everyone in the town seemed to like the idea of having a small tree in their children's bedrooms. So, people would climb up there with an axe and take what they wanted, so there weren't as many at hand. Lena, at one time, had thought it was sad to cut down and kill the trees just for people to look at. But Pete explained to her about tradition and that he was sure more would grow back. With time, she forgot this protest and looked forward to the years when she could have one. If a smaller tree couldn't be found, they had a lovely synthetic one which would sit at her window. Secretly, she loved this just as much. But as her father had said, tradition is tradition. The larger tree would be placed in the living room and adorned with an assortment of baubles, glittering decorations, and lights. The other, in Lena's room, would be sprayed with a can of fake snow and covered in hanging candy sticks and chocolates. Although she was always told she could only have one a day before bed as a treat, of course, occasionally she would break this rule and just hope no one would notice. Janet could always tell, but she would let it go. Christmas time was the best of times after all, and Dip was so brief. As Pete approached the hill, he knew something was wrong. He felt it in his bones. As he climbed, the snow began to fall in greater volume and the sky dimmed with it. Standing at the humble summit, a stillness spread. Silence interrupted momentarily by the almost audible patter of snowflakes floating gently to the ground. He followed the footprints now with purpose, knowing that if the snowfall increased, that it would be nearly impossible to find Janet. Twilight fell, covering everything in a dark blue wisp of color as the frost began to nip at his now rosy cheeks. The footprints bobbed and weaved their way through the huge pines, finally stopping next to a wonderfully thick and vibrant tree, one which was perfectly suited for their purposes, the perfect size. Almost seven feet tall, a deep, life-filled green, and a thick abundance of branches and pines which made it almost impossible to visually penetrate its cover in such a light. But yet, Janet was nowhere to be seen, and as far as Pete could tell, there were no other tracks in the snow leading away in any direction. She had almost certainly been there, but where had she gone? This was both puzzling and worrying. It seemed impossible, but there they were. Janet's last two footprints engraved in the ground. But the snow all around, virgin, undisturbed, and lacking all signs of life. It was as if she had just vanished into the night. Looking at the base of the tree, Pete ran his fingers over a deep gash in its trunk. There was no doubt about it. Janet had taken a few swipes at it with her axe. Then, for some unknown reason, she had left. Or perhaps moved on to a tree she felt was more suitable. Surely not, though. This tree was perfect. That must have been it, though. She must have moved on. Perhaps there was some random, freakish flurry of snow which covered her tracks. Yes, that must have been it. But Pete knew this was wishful thinking. He had lived there for years, and in all of that time he had never seen such a thing. Then he saw it. Several meters away, lying in the snow, was Janet's axe. He rushed over to the object, falling once as the snow deepened. Rising to his feet, it was now unmistakable. Yes, it was partially covered in snow, but it was Janet's axe all right. It lay there much like the footprints, isolated, but with the absence of any human imprints. It was as if the tool had been dropped from a great height, but Pete did not care to speculate. A sense of growing worry permeated his mind as the thought of Janet lying somewhere injured increased his anxiety. Shouting his wife's name repeatedly drew no reply as darkness now began to creep ever closer. If she was hurt, he would have to raise the alarm and get the town out looking for her, along with mountain rescue. She wouldn't survive long in the snow, in that biting cold. At this thought, the panic grew. Worry, fear, hurt that could only be felt through love. With torch in hand, he continued in the direction the axe had taken him. As he entered a thick den of pine trees, he noticed the broken branches littered on the ground as if something had rushed past, tearing them apart and breaking them off 
on impact. Maybe Janet ran through here? The scale of damage, however, looked too great to have been dealt by one person alone. Had he been in any other country, he would have assumed a bear was nearby. But they had been hunted to extinction in Scotland long ago, along with the wolves and any other predators. For a moment, his torch reflected off of something scuttling under a bush, but it looked more like an insect than anything else. And again, far too small to cause such devastation. Pete fixed his scarf, trying to cover his face as the frost bit deeper. But just as he did so, something caught his eye. Something on the ground, shining his torch on what he at first thought to be a dead animal was the crumpled body of Janet lying still on the ground. A heart attack, they said. A heart attack. But Pete had seen her face. He had looked upon those eyes, once so filled with kindness, transfixed in a frozen stare. Cold, glassy, black with fear. Her hands were clenched in front of her, and the pathologist told him that this was perfectly normal for one suffering such a massive heart attack and such low temperatures as was the contorted look on her face. Although, at the mention of this, Pete saw a flicker in the pathologist's eyes which gave away that he was as puzzled by that look as anyone. A look Pete would never forget. Darling Janet, love of his life, mother of his children, dying alone in the cold, with lips pulled back over teeth in agony, frozen into an inhuman sneer. The whole ordeal had devastated him. If it hadn't been for their daughter, Lena, for the necessity of her needs to be met before his own, Peter would have found it nearly impossible to have gotten through it. The past 12 months had been cluttered with reminders of an aching loss. As with any bereavement, the first time of doing something once shared without that person made the pain more acute. The first Christmas, the first day at work, the first walk to school, the first family get-together, Every person's face etched and concerned, accompanied by the usual, well-meaning, but empty traditions of, how are you holding up, it must have been so difficult, and, if there's anything I can do. Helping his daughter through the loss of her mother was all he had to make sure he could face another day. But that stopped now. They had been through the horror, through the denial, through the silent meals, through the lonely cries of despair at night, through the birthdays empty and somber. They had been through it all. All these firsts were over. It had been over 12 months since Janet's death and Pete felt almost exhilarated by this. He still missed her every day. The pain would never truly leave him, but the feeling of accomplishment, of strength, something which he thought had deserted him, that he had endured filled him for the first time with thoughts of the future. Thoughts that life does indeed go on, even when our dearest have gone before us. And what of his beautiful daughter, dear kind Elena? He may have felt compelled to bring her through the past year, but her empathy and strength had left him in awe, characteristics which someone so young had no right to possess, but which were thankfully present nonetheless. When she had cried, he had been there, and on more than one occasion, when he lay sobbing, staring at that empty void of space in his double bed at night, Lena would awaken and climb in beside him, and they would both cry together until they fell asleep. She was his rock, and by God she was going to have the best Christmas she'd ever have. Pete had made a number of arrangements. He had spent a fortune on every gift imaginable. He had filled the house with every food and treat that she enjoyed. And both Janet's parents and his own were flying in for Christmas dinner to be with their brave, sweet little granddaughter. He'd also organized for Lena's friends to have a sleepover on Boxing Day, which she had pleaded for. But Pete always knew he would give in eventually. He never asked for much, but... This year, this Christmas, she would have more than she could imagine. The house was perfect, but there was one thing left to do. 
One thing that Pete had dreamt of since the night he found Janet's body. She had chosen that tree. It was going to be sitting in their living room adorned with all manner of decorations. That was its purpose. Its very reason for being. Janet never finished cutting the damn thing down. It was in many ways her dying act. And Pete was going to make sure that it was fulfilled. On the anniversary of her death, he wandered through the snow, winding his way through the pines until he stood at the foot of that ominous little hill. The sun shone brightly, and it wasn't as cold as it had been the night Janet died, but each footstep was accompanied by a sickness in the pit of Pete's stomach, each stride a morbid reminder of the previous year and that terrible heartbreak in the snow. Marching to its peak, he first walked to and observed the scene of Janet's untimely death, standing there where her body had laid. Pete wiped the tears from his eyes and placed a small Santa figure on the ground, burying it in the snow. It had always been hung from the branches of each yearly tree and was her favorite decoration. It seemed only right that it be with her. Another few minutes of trudging, there it was. It was still standing. That damn tree, as if ravenous for revenge. Pete pulled Janet's axe from his backpack and charged at the pine. He battered and chopped at the cut, which Janet had made the previous year, making it deeper with every slice, with every pound of pressure he could muster. The tree groaned and creaked as if in pain, but Pete did not care. This tree was the final reminder of Janet's death. Whatever had happened that night, it happened because of that tree. As crazy as it seemed, it all made sense for a moment, and then clarity was clouded by mundane reality. She had simply died of natural causes. With the roar of croaked wood breaking under its own weight, the tree swooned and collapsed to the ground in defeat. Tying a rope around its trunk, and then using string to fold its branches inward. Pete dragged that memory, that cold-hearted pillar of nature's brutality, through the snow, over grass and gravel, and finally to his back door. He was victorious. With little thought for carpet or furniture, he dragged it up the stairs into the house and placed it in front of the window in the living room, wedging it upright into an old wooden slump they had used as a stand every year. Breathless and covered in sweat, he stood back looking at the tree, standing tall over all it surveyed. You picked a good one, love. You picked a good one. He held back the tears and waited for Lena to return home from her friends. Pete put an old Christmas film on the television as they both decorated the tree together, singing, laughing, and being a family. There were moments fleeting glances when they caught one another's stare, a glance which showed pain buried deep down inside, one which said, I miss her too, but it was Christmas, and the moments of grief passed, buffered by longer caring periods of happiness. Contentment caressed smiles from ear to ear, and festive spirit once more filled that home, which had for too long been host to loss and anguish. As night began to fall, after Lena went to bed, earlier than usual because the excitement had worn her out, Pete decided to reward himself for the day's efforts. The lights were dimmed, and after pouring himself a large whiskey, he sat on the living room couch and stared at the tree. Draped in tinsel garlands and adorned with bright white Christmas lights, it really was a sight to behold. The best tree they had ever had. Here's to you, gorgeous, Peter said, lifting his drink to the sky in a symbolic gesture. Staring at the Christmas tree, its beautiful lights casting a warm hue over the room, and the snow quietly falling outside as the sun set, Pete began to think of the past year, of his daughter Lena and his wife Janet. Time passed slowly as he thought of all things gone, how they had led to this moment through pain and suffering but now hopefully onwards to the future, and one filled with at least the briefest possibility of joy. 
The glow from the tree reflected off the window, but it penetrated far enough to illuminate the now thick blur of snow falling to the ground silently outside. The room remained dark, but the lights bathed everything subtly in a warm, yuletide radiance, which then accompanied by the orange lambency of the fire, only served to cultivate the anticipation for Christmas even more so. For the first time in a year, Pete was happy. Something bothered him, though. There was a slight apprehension or annoyance at the back of his mind, something which was spoiling the display. Sipping at his whiskey, casting a glance at the entire room, he finally saw what the problem was. Two of the Christmas tree lights were occasionally flickering, not constantly, but often enough to be noticeable, and more importantly, aggravating. Downing the rest of his drink, Peter rose to his feet. Now feeling the aches in his muscles from the effort exerted while dragging that thing all the way home from the hill. Walking over to the tree, the lights were indeed flickering, but there was something unusual about them. They seemed deeper than the rest, as if coming from around the trunk rather than resting on the branches. Again, Pete was struck by how dark the interior of the tree was, that even in the presence of many lights placed upon it, he could not peer or adequately see between the branches. Even the two lights which set deeper behind the pines did not seem to illuminate their surroundings in any way. The empty glass slipped from his fingers, smashing to the floor. The lights were fine, they were not flickering at all, but the occasional blinking of two eyes amongst the branches had been enough to catch his attention. He froze to the spot, and it was as if the room somehow grew darker. Something stirred between the pines, between the knotted wood and the scratch porous surface. Something lived there. A feeling of utter paralysis now took hold. His feet firmly glued to the ground as the two eyes slowly pushed forward. Creaking and cracking, a face revealed itself from between the pine-covered branches, as if seeping out from its innermost visceral point. Mold-covered, ancient, its features twisted in rage. Fear began to course through Pete's veins. His heart beat faster and faster as the face moved closer. Its eyes devoid of pupils now swamped in a maddening yellow. And from below, the protrusion of two thin, moss-covered legs arching out from beneath the branches. With a creak and snap, it straightened itself now standing in all of its terrible glory in front of the tree. It was now pitch black outside, and it would have been clear to Pete that this animal, this creature, was of a nocturnal nature, but in its stare he found himself helpless. His heart skipped. First it was a palpitation, then he could feel a searing pain in his left arm. He clutched his chest, but his feet remained adhered to the ground, but it was impossible to look away from these yellow, unmarked eyes. Its gaze came closer still, and in the pain which it brought, Pete knew he was going to die, to be found like Janet, cold, face contorted, and the second victim of that which lived amongst the pines on that hill. The pain was now unbearable, but the paralysis removed the possibility of a scream. What a little light there was from the fireplace now illuminated its head, elongated on one side and pulsating on the other, its face dominated by a large dark hole which appeared in place of a mouth or nose, one which no light could penetrate as its boil-ridden head stooped to meet his own, and the hole in its face almost touched his mouth. An involuntary sneer pulled Pete's lips to reveal his teeth as his face contorted into an entirely unnatural position. Then, that one word. A word so powerful, so pure that even the most evil of intentions could be dispelled by it. Daddy. With a snap of wood, the gargoyle-like creature turned its wide, yellow gaze to Lena. Standing at the bottom of the stairs in her pajamas, her scream echoed out into the night. Arms outstretched. Its odd-numbered fingers moved with a stutter as its moss-covered legs groaned, carrying it forward in a peculiar, unbalanced motion toward her. 
Now Lena was paralyzed by its stare, and with each step closer, her face contorted more fiercely, and the pain in her chest brought her to the point of unconsciousness. As intense as its ancient gaze was, it was focused, so focused that it did not notice Pete clawing his way across the floor towards the kitchen. The wooden creature's unsure movements made it appear more like a puppet than a thing of autonomous purpose, and as it reached Lena, it cupped her face with its uneven hands and stared wide-eyed and pupilless into her face. Tears streamed down her cheeks. The sound of feet running filled the air, and as it twisted to investigate, a loud crack was heard as Pete ran up onto the couch, jumping high into the air, bringing Janet's axe down deep into its spine. No blood ran or gushed, but a plague of unfamiliar insect-like critters poured out of the wound. Instead of a howl of pain, the creature emitted a crescendo of strained squeals and clicks before throwing Pete to the ground and smashing through the back door. Lena's father gave chase, but it was impossible as the wooden creation moved at an unimaginable pace, gliding on the ground with each stride, leaving no footprints in the snow. After a visit to the nearest hospital, both Lena and her father were given a clean bill of health, but they never returned to that house, filled with memories of the good times, the happy times, of a mother, a wife, a kind soul, of birthdays and weddings, and of course, of Christmas time. Pete didn't know what that creature was, whether it was alive or dead, or something else entirely inconceivable to human mind. But he made a solemn promise to himself from that moment on, never again would he cut down a tree, decorate it, and take enjoyment in its appearance as it died, because no matter how pretty they are, no matter how much warmth they may give, no matter how much they might make people think of Christmas, you just don't know what may be living inside. The Christmas tree in the town square stood tall for all to look at it in awe. The varying reds and blues and yellows and greens coiled around the towering tree like a colorful snake. Children tightly clutched the hands of their mothers and fathers and grinned with crooked teeth at the masterful display of the holidays. Its light cast onto the empty buildings and lonely streets emptied by the men and women standing around the spectacle. In the wake of the cheerful holiday smiles came another surprise. Snow began to fall from the sky, dressing the streets in a growing blanket of sparkling white, heavier than a flurry, yet not quite a storm. Children stuck their tongues out with flushed cheeks, giggling as a myriad of snowflakes melted on them. And for that moment, in the bitter cold, it seemed as though the world revolved only around that tree that stood tall in front of them. But there was, of course, the one and only family within that small town who had decidedly rejected the invitation to be around the others. Alas, the woman was much more content sitting idly in her chair and waiting for information regarding her husband. She had told her child that he had been out working the last few days, trying her best to cover up the fact that he had, in fact, gone missing. Now, with four days gone by and nothing to show for it, all she could do was stare intently at the static on the television and neglect the wilting Christmas tree. The woman barely grasped the half-empty bottle of vodka in her hand, and when she heard the pitter-patter of soft feet, she instinctively placed it in the shadows beside her. Her gaze fell on the small boy that sprinted into the living room. She waved a tiny turquoise blanket back and forth. Mommy! His shrill voice cut through the buzz she had acquired from the alcohol. She winced. There's a man with a badge at the door. He said he wants to talk to you. Her daze was immediately broken as she sat upright in the chair, staring at him with a furious rage in her eyes. You opened the door? She scolded. The boy stared at her for a moment before looking down, only to be met with a backhand across the face. He stepped back, grabbing his reddening face with tears breaming in his eyes. She stood up, exhaling sharply. 
I told you to tell me first when someone knocks. She sighed in exasperation, stumbling out of the living room and hugging the wall for balance, and she moved to the front door and opened it a crack. Deep in the background, she could hear Frosty the Snowman playing in the boy's room. She shooed her child away, opening the door up enough for her face to be seen. A police officer stood in the snow, fingers in the loops of his belt, as he greeted her with a grin. She met his grin with a deep frown. What are you doing here so late? Her voice was slurred, causing the officer's expression to waver. Your husband. His voice was deep, but as soft as his expression. We've learned a little bit more about where he might be. Her expression almost immediately changed. She stepped back, opening the door fully. The officer stepped in, raking his feet across the welcome carpet first as a blast of cold burst into the warm house. She closed the door quickly, shuddering from the bitter weather. Further down the lonely streets, there was movement in the dark shadows beside the buildings and broken lampposts. A figure walked through the darkness as if it was their home, the hood on his head further veiling the lithe person's face from view of the naked eye. The being walked slowly, as if savoring the bitter cold that surrounded them as pitch black boots left prints in the thin blanket of snow. The figure began to speak with the voice of a delicate man. It was a whisper, with the softness of an enthralling lullaby. However, there was a clear malevolence within his undertone. The soft noise sung at a slow pace. It's a most wonderful time of the year. Nobody was around to hear the man's enchanting voice. However, he seemed to enjoy the solitude surrounding him. Under his arm, he cradled a large cardboard box wrapped haphazardly with a variety of different papers. A substance dribbled from the bottom corner of the box and onto the snow, though the hue was unseen in the darkness. With the kids jingle belling and everyone telling me of it the shadowed man suddenly was subjected to the dim spectrum of a barely functioning streetlight. Pitch black eyes sparkled against the brightness as his pale and sunken in face was shown. However, the visual was only granted for a brief moment as he continued his troll. A droplet of crimson red sunk into the blanket of white as he passed by the streetlight. He looked forward to the police cruiser parked in front of the home that he had been traversing through the snow to find. A small grin formed on his features. His soft feet cracked against the snowy sidewalk with a purpose as he tried his best to stay within the darkness, inching closer to the home. Eventually, he stood at the front door of the dreary yet moderately lit up building, and at that point, he walked up the three concrete stairs, continuously singing to himself, it's the most wonderful time of the year. He placed the box down at the top step, adjusting the large ribbon that had been placed on it. He stood up, his grin growing from ear to ear as the light washed over his face. A large and jagged scar ran from just beside his eye all the way to his lower jawline. He lifted his clenched fist up, wrapping it on the door a few times. He waited a few moments before turning around, quickly slinking back into the shadows before the door was opened. The woman had taken her place back in the reclining chair. The officer stood awkwardly as he explained the current situation to her, purposefully ignoring the stench of alcohol on her breath and darting his gaze away from her half-closed eyes. She pushed her bottle of vodka back behind the chair and she listened as intently as she could to the man. She nodded slowly. So, you found his car? The officer solemnly nodded, granting her another faint smile. Yes, on the outskirts of town, hidden in the trees. He looked away from her fully, now, and glanced at the Christmas tree that had shed much of its pine needles due to malnourishment. We don't know why it's there, or where he ran off to, but it's a start. They have the canine unit sniffing 
or any abnormal scent right now. The wife took solace in that knowledge. Her husband possibly being okay was better than the uncertainty she had been facing. As if on cue, the little boy ran out into the living room once again, practically jumping from the balls of his feet. I heard a knock, mommy. She sat up with a sigh. I didn't open the door this time, mommy. I, I promise. She pushed past him, walking down the hallway with the police officer behind her. She opened the door only a crack at first, checking to see if anyone was actually there. She saw no person, but a large gift placed at their doorstep. With a raised eyebrow, she opened the door, glancing to the various different wrapping papers used to wrap around the outside of the box. The officer eyed the present closely before his expression changed. Great concern washed over him as he stepped in front of her with a nervous chuckle. <laughs> uh, l uh, let me open it first. Uh, probably some pranksters again. <laughs> he stepped outside and took out his box cutter, getting onto his knees as he drew in a deep breath. This wasn't the fault of any teenage pranksters. He had been in the force long enough to know exactly what this was. With great caution, he took the ribbon off and tossed it aside, pressed the blade into the wrapping paper, and through the top of the box. He ran the knife across until he was able to open the top with ease. As he opened it, he drew back quickly, covering his mouth as he fought the urge to vomit. The present had been even worse than he imagined it to be. Curiously, the wife took a look inside. Her expression distorted in shock as she let out a blood-curdling scream that echoed across the darkened sky. She hugged the wall as the little boy ran to the noise. Mommy, what's wrong? But she didn't respond, simply falling to her knees as she sobbed into her hands. The boy placed a small hand over her shoulder. Mommy! The child moved to take a glance at the contents of the present. However, the officer stood up quickly and covered the boy's eyes, drawing him back as he stared inside the box in terror. Inside the box was a severed head, submerged to the chin in its own pool of blood. The man's hair had been matted with the substance, and his eyes were wide, almost alive with terror. His mouth hung open, and his face was riddled with cuts and bruises. A scar ran from just to the right of his eye all the way down across the cheek to the lower jawline. The top of his head was a Santa hat tinted with droplets of blood. The officer pushed the child back to his mother, who held on to her with a confused expression on his face. The officer barely stood on shaky legs, holding a ripped piece of the wrapping paper and staring at it. It seemed that the legends were, in fact, true. He stared at the sticker that had been stuck to the wrapping paper a still image of Santa waving his mitten to the person looking. The tag read, To the Fortunate Family, from Serious Nightshade. I'm here. A fire faintly lit the room in a fluorescent glow, giving it a homely feeling. The warmth spread to every corner of the house, and in the edge of the room, to the right stood the Christmas tree. Its dazzling beauty brought awe to the man who stood in the center of the living room, who had recently come down the chimney. He was a tall man, and fat at that. He was dressed in a heavy red jacket lined with white fur. His eyes sparkled as he witnessed the lights wrapped around the tree, reflecting off of the ornaments hanging on its green branches. The large man sniffed the air from the surrounding room. The smell of pine entered his nose, causing his lips to curve into a smile. He slowly stepped over the fireplace, the fire burning as bright as ever. Above it hung velvet stockings with silver lining laced into the fabric to spell the words, Dad and Sarah. The man reached into his pocket and pulled out a brown bag. With a swift motion, he pulled a single candy cane out of the bag and gently placed them into the stocking named Sarah with care. He glared at the stocking named Dad for a second before breaking his ice-cold stare away. With this, he moved into the kitchen. He entered the kitchen and trudged to the counter, where a strange odor immediately struck the large man in the nose. 
The smell of hard liquor was accompanied by a porcelain plate set upon the table in the center of the room. There sat a glass of milk beside the freshly baked chocolate cookies stacked on top of each other. Pleased, the man reached for the glass and gulped the milk down. He rubbed the mustache he had recently acquired off of his face with his arm and allowed his gaze to return to the cookies. He ogled them for a few seconds, hunger in his eyes. Soon after, he grabbed one and placed it in his mouth, munching the small chunks between his teeth, which were as white as snow. The crumbs fell from his mouth and into a scraggly beard as the jolly fellow continued on to the base of the stairwell. He reached his hands out to guide himself upwards until he stumbled upon the second level of the house. Paper cutouts of snowflakes hung in the long corridor. The moonlight seeped through the windows of the hall, which gave an eerie glow. The man took a step forward which caused the wooden floor to gently creak, halting his advance. His eyes darted around the house, not daring to move a muscle. Dust bunnies floated through the air, and silence became ever-present to the point where one could hear a single pin drop. The man held his breath and then gently released it, carefully taking another step forward. With each creak, he stopped in fear of exposure. However, nobody seemed to hear the unannounced visitor. Before long, a man arrived at a wooden door near the end of the hall. He saw the door at the end of the room as well. It was where the child slept, but not soundly. The large man knew of her bruises and pain at the hands of the one she should have trusted the most. Santa knew all of the children, after all. Turning his attention back to the door in front of him, he gripped the brass handle, its surface frozen. He twisted the knob and opened the door, leaving it ajar. A single figure was laying in a bed, the specific details concealed by the shadows of the room. The man walked to the side of the bed and lifted a picture that sat on the dresser. The photo contained a family, a man, a woman, and a small girl. The man smiled for a second before setting the frame down. Next to where the photo was originally positioned sat more bottles of liquor. Several bottles sat empty and several more filled to the brim and on the floor beside the bed was a long leather belt, bloodied on the metal area. Judging by the large frame of a figure under the cover, the man presumed they were the parents in the photograph, or at least one of them. A frown crawled onto the man's face as he uncovered the sheets to reveal the father from the photograph. Enraged, the man grabbed the pillow on the other side of the bed and brought it down to the father's face. The father's body instantly began to tremble as he clawed at the large man, desperately trying to remove the pillow. It was a fruitless effort, the pillow and the might of the man proving too powerful. The inhuman strength he possessed outmatched the father's strength tenfold. The father's arms dropped down the side of the bed as his body went limp. He wouldn't hurt her again. The jolly fellow made sure of that. Once the deed was done, the man pulled the covers over the corpse and retreated to the window at the back of the room. The silky white snow gently fell to the ground in a peaceful manner. The night sky sparkled with the twinkling stars, and the man's eyes twinkled as well. He exited the room and took a deep sigh, unhappy he had to do such things. It was when he was about to turn around and leave, however, that he remembered the door at the very end of the hall the girl's room. The man crept forth with silent footsteps, careful not to stir the girl from her slumber. Opening the door, he found himself in a slightly lit room thanks to a small nightlight plugged into the wall. Pink snowflakes emitted from the light danced about on the blue ceiling in a soothing pattern. In the very corner of the room was a small bed in the shape of a car. The man approached it, he gently lifted the covers to reveal the body underneath them, and there, comfortably resting in bed, was the little girl from the picture frame. He stooped down to the girl's level and watched her sleep. His teeth practically touched his ears as he leaned over her and sniffed her delicate blonde hair. The girl grunted in her sleep, not seeming to notice the presence in her room. 
Scars and bruises covered her back and shoulders, and patches of her skin were scarred. The man licked his thumb, covering it in moist saliva. He gently cooed as he rubbed the girl's cheek ever so slightly as to not wake her. For several minutes, the man couldn't help but watch her until he eventually pressed his soft, moist lips against her forehead for a few seconds. He then spoke so gently into her ear, his voice raspy and queer. Have a Merry Christmas, little girl. May all your wishes come true. With that, the jolly fat man exited the room and snuck back to the living room, where the tree still stood in all its glimmering glory. He had left a large red sack on the couch earlier, and he went to retrieve it. He brought the bag to the tree and opened the sack, withdrawing presents, toys, and all sorts of candies. After proceeding to set several presents under the tree, the man exited the cozy home. Now in the crisp winter air, he looked back upon the house. He smirked slightly, relishing the night. He had delivered the joy of Christmas to a little girl which needed it. And for that, he was proud. He walked away, his large footprints covered soon after by the fresh snowflakes which gently fell to the ground. The sun rose over the horizon, its bright orange glow cleansing the land of its darkness and revealing the shimmering snow spread across the plains. A little girl woke from her slumber and hopped out of bed. She let out a quick yawn before hustling to her parents' bedroom. Her face was dull and her energy lackluster as she reluctantly headed for her father's room and by his bed. She hesitantly poked at his body, her face a blank canvas. He didn't wake up. He hardly even showed any signs of motion at all. Again, she tried to wake him, but to no avail. She frowned a bit at this, but not for long. She wanted to go open what presents she got from Santa. She knew that he wouldn't want her to open the presents without him there to see her, but she also didn't feel like waiting for him to get up and drag himself to the tree with her either. Hanging her head low, she knew what choice she had to make, lest she be punished. She dragged herself away from the room, completely overcome with boredom. Wandering back to her room, she sat down on the edge of her bed. Her eyes wandered to the floor of her room, where the smooth beige carpet had an impact. An imprint of a foot, and a large one at that. To the North Pole. Dear Santa, I hope you and the reindeer are doing okay. I hope that you are busy with the other kids, so I won't ask for a lot. All I really want for Christmas is my dad to be okay. It's been a while since mommy left and daddy has not been the same. He yells a lot more now and hurts me. I don't know why, but I just want it to stop. Please help my daddy, Santa. It's all I want. Love, Sarah. I don't hide the fact that I hate Christmas. Call me a proviable Scrooge. Insult me to no end. But every year, I feel a dread greater than anyone who hates the holiday season could ever claim. If you know me personally, you'd assume it's because of my younger brother's disappearance. And you'd be right for the most part. It happened one Christmas morning, when by all rights... The two of us should have been sitting by our tree opening presents and making treasured childhood moments. Instead, I was treated with a day of police frantically searching our house and neighborhood while questioning my distraught parents. They questioned me too, of course. As a ten-year-old girl, I didn't have much to say. I told them that he and I had gone to bed, excited for what the next day had in store for us. And that was the last I saw of him. He just never came down to open his gifts, and that's when Mother discovered his room was empty. But that was a lie. I do know what happened to Chris. I know who took him away. And I know that if I told the truth, no one would believe me, then or now. Santa kidnapped my brother. Please don't laugh. I know how it sounds. And you're right. It sounds ridiculous. He can't be real. 
and even if he was, he's supposed to be nice to children. But I know what I saw, and it wasn't some lunatic in a Santa suit either. That man was as real as a winter wind that chills you down to the bone. I suppose I should start by telling you how all this started. Before the holiday was ruined for my family, that Christmas Eve we all left out cookies for Santa, talked about what we hoped he would bring, and then our parents read the night before Christmas to my brother and I, all of them cheerful, mundane traditions from our family. What was different that final year was I was notably less enthusiastic about the whole process. It was the first year I had openly stopped believing in Santa Claus. I was a strange and cynical child, much to the concern of my parents. To tell you the truth, until that fateful night, I had never really been a believer in Santa Claus. I mostly just played along to please adults, and that year I was tired of all the acting. That's one of the many ways we differed so much, my brother and I. You see, Chris was a young, energetic, and curious boy. I remember the year he was taken was also the year where he had found where our parents were hiding our unwrapped gifts weeks ahead of time. He refused to tell his own big sister what she was going to be getting, though. Figures, I guess. Most importantly, however... Being three years younger than me, he was still very much a believer. My flat denials of the existence of Santa Claus only served as a challenge to him, and he was determined to prove otherwise. We were heading up the stairs to bed when he got my attention. Stay with me, he said as he tucked at my pajama sleeve. I'll show you. He's real. We'll catch him in the act. I bet we'll be the first ones to have ever done it. And I'm sure he'll give us all kinds of stuff when we do. I sighed. <sighs> I'd rather just get some sleep, Chris. I told him. You go on believing if you want. But I don't have to just to have a good Christmas. I always tried to avoid being such a damper on his spirit. And I thought convincing him to forget his hairbane schemes would be better than waiting up half the night just to see his disappointment. Oh, come on, sis, he cried. Do I always have to make you have fun? If it weren't for me, you'd turn into a boring old lady just like Miss Henderson. I must have made a disgusted face because Chris laughed, gave a mischievous grin and said, Well, what's it going to be, Mrs. Henderson? Are we going to catch Santa in the act or not? Mrs. Henderson was my fourth grade teacher, and I despised the old crone with a passion. Chris knew how to push my buttons. All right, short stuff, you're on, I said with more bravado than I actually felt. First to fall asleep has to wait till New Year's to open their gifts from Santa. Chris's eyes flashed with excitement at the wager. I'll take that bet. So, we went to our rooms to wait for our parents' turn to go to bed. After the lights downstairs went out, I waited about half hour just to make sure they were asleep. And I crept out of my bed and sneaked my way downstairs. I saw that there was a light on in the living room. Chris was sitting casually near the fireplace. What took you so long? He asked, always the confident one. I waited for mom and dad to get to sleep, idiot, I replied. They're not going to be too happy if they find us here. With an unceremonious plop, I sat down on the couch directly in front of the fireplace. So, how do you expect to stay up the entire night, I asked. I imagine I'll figure it out, Chris said. I'm not sure how long we waited there for so-called St. Nick to appear, but Chris looked almost ready to doze off when we were shocked awake by something that must have been large and heavy hitting the roof. After a short pause, there was a sound of shuffling and the scraping of feet. I was sure I heard the ringing of little bells. Oh, man, Chris whispered in awe. It's really him. For a moment... I wondered why mom and dad weren't awoken by any of this. 
All this racket was enough to wake the dead. But that train of thought stopped when chimney soot started sprinkling down into the fireplace. Chris dashed over to me and shook my shoulders. What did I tell you? He's real. He's real. Unlike Chris, I didn't think there was any supernatural explanation behind the strange occurrence. I was convinced it was a burglar finding their way in through unconventional means. I sat stiffly staring at the fireplace for a few moments, unsure of what to do, until I rose and dived underneath the couch to hide. What are you doing? Chris cried in bewilderment. He's coming. Get down, I whispered fiercely at him. We don't know who that really is. Chris opened his mouth to protest, but a voice let out a grunt from the chimney and it spooked him enough to find a spot of his own. He hid behind Dad's large leather lounge chair in the corner. A few moments after a final loud thump came and the front of our fireplace was obscured by all the soot rushing out into the air. I covered my mouth and nose trying desperately to prevent myself from coughing. When it finally settled, the sight gave my cynical mind a serious shock. The old man that stood before me really was someone dressed as Santa Claus, and he looked every inch the part. His body was the perfect size. He had the long white beard, and his outfit was a beautifully made red jacket and pants. His face contained the soft, loving features of an old man enjoying the moment. What surprised me the most about this strange man was even though he had just entered through our musty chimney, There wasn't a single speck of soot on him. It was almost as if something that could mar his perfect appearance was naturally repelled. I was finally convinced he was the real deal by what came next. Throwing his sack of presents over his shoulder, Santa stepped away from the fireplace and a short elf girl emerged to follow him. The elf had pointed ears, a glistening green suit, and was so short She only came up to Nina's knee. Unlike the jolly old man, she seemed terrified to take a single step into our home. She looked all around as if there was some terrible threat in the room and seemed only slightly relieved when she mistakenly thought it was empty. Santa noticed the fear, but rather than reassure her, as would be expected, for a fraction of a second, his kind face changed into a look of pure horrifying malice. It was like the kind old man had been replaced by an insane, merciless master only to return a nanosecond later. The elf's mood changed on a dime. In short order, she was filling out stockings with small toys and candy with a smile plastered onto her face that seemed ready to crack at any moment. Being so short, she had to use some kind of magic to levitate so she could get within reach. With purposeful yet quiet footsteps, Santa made his way to our tree. Taking two presents from his bag, he placed them into the proper spot and went to where we had left his traditional snack. The elf was done with her job too, but Santa wasn't inclined to share with his companion. Now that she was towing in lock, he barely even acknowledged her presence. She just stood there next to him, waiting for him to finish, bringing her hands in nervous movements. On his face, the whole scene like something ripped straight from a Christmas television special. But even at my young age, I could tell that something more was going on. What I'm trying to say is, it seemed like they were attempting to appear whimsical for whimsy's sake. Like it was all one big act they were putting on. The little elf barely passed as a convincing actress. And Santa's momentary lapse only cemented any suspensions. It was something I was unable to articulate fully at the time, but I can now. It looked like a ruse. Chris fell for it right away. He must have been too young to notice the sinister signs that I had been able to pick up on. From my angle on the floor, I could see him clearly in his own hiding spot. The look on his face told me everything I needed to know. He was completely enamored with these two people. To my horror, he slowly crept out from behind the chair. 
I wanted to call out to him, to tell him to stay right where he was, that these two were strangers, that there was no way to tell what would happen once they knew we were there, but that would have given us both away. It's not like he wouldn't have listened to me either. How many kids out there can't help but trust Santa Claus? Wow, he whispered to a bizarre intruders. It's really you. At this, both Santa and his help turned to find Chris standing in the middle of the living room. Both had this faux expression of surprise that only served to unsettle me further. Waiting up for us, I see. Santa commented with a warm smile. Yeah, Chris said cheerfully. I wanted to prove that you were really real and everything. <laughs> and it seems you have, Santa replied with a chuckle. He sat down in my father's chair and motioned to Chris to sit with him, to which he obliged. Oh man, I've got so many questions, Chris exclaimed. Are the reindeer on the roof? Can I see them? What's it like living in the North Pole? Oh, I wish I could see it someday. <laughs> All in good time, Santa said, grinning at his remark. Maybe to some, it would have looked like a friendly expression. But to me, it was a smile that seemed to contain the self-satisfaction of winning a game. As for the elf, she had lost all color in her face. She made no move whatsoever as the two sat together. But her expression was enough to tell me that something horrible was about to happen. I knew you were real. I just knew it, Chris said. And all the big kids at school give us such a hard time about it. Even Sis was losing it too. Just wait until everyone hears about this. They won't, Chris, Santa said, clasping his glove hand over my brother's shoulder. Huh? Why not? He asked, confused. Do, do I have to keep it a secret? Santa laughed a deep, evil laugh that was too much unlike his fabled ho ho ho. <laughs> do you honestly think that you've been the only one to ever see me? That throughout history, the many little children of the world haven't done the same as you. Chris shifted uncomfortably in the man's lap. Uh, um, I guess not. You see, Chris, Santa began, children are not to be trusted. They're the ignorant, greedy, and selfish offspring of humans. A greedy and selfish race to begin with. Over the years, I've been able to sustain myself on these human qualities, and humans have happily whitewashed my persona in order to satiate their desires without guilt. It's the perfect season for it. Don't you agree, my dear boy? The excitement in Chris's face was all but gone now. He was finally starting to get it. The children who seek me out always want something, Santa said. More meaningless possessions, satisfaction of curiosity, or simple proof for only a few examples. However, there is always a price to be paid for breaking the rules and finding something that is not meant to be found. Throughout this conversation, the elf began to gather the gifts they had brought with a hint of reluctance. She even managed to make the cookies Santa ate magically reappear. She was ridding the house of any evidence of their presence. Santa's hand squeezed Chris's shoulder tightly. I've always looked for more helpers, he continued. Children who have seen me, who can never keep such a secret, are the perfect candidates. My brother's face turned to an expression of absolute fear. He now realized his fatal error. You are not the first, he said. You certainly won't be the last. Turning to his elf, Santa barked out a command. Annabelle, 
It's time. Change him now. No, please, please, I... The elf stammered. Please, please don't make me... Santa gave her a cruel look of disdain and waved his hand towards her in an odd way. I was horrified to see the elf suddenly start clawing frantically at her face, digging her nails into her own skin. She screeched in pain, unable to stop harming herself. Santa waved his hand again, releasing her from her torture. Her face was now covered in scratches and dripping with blood. Chris screamed and dove off Santa's lap, trying to rush out of the room, but the old man made another strange wave with his hand and Christopher stopped in his tracks. As if possessed, my brother turned around to face him, his eyes wide with fear. He was under that awful man's control. Don't you see? It's too late for you now, he said triumphantly. Accept your fate. With a smug grin, Santa looked to his companion. I should really start having you all wear red, he said in a mocking tone. At least then the blood wouldn't show so much. Are you going to do as I told you now, Annabelle? Or do I have to think of something worse for you? The elf let out a heavy sob and looked up to my terrified brother. I'm... I'm sorry... She said in a sad, high-pitched voice. From there, I could see her tears mingling with blood as she took a little silver wand hidden in the folds of her clothes. She pointed it directly at my brother and a blind flash filled the room. It took some time for my sight to recover, but when it did, I saw the Chris I knew disappearing before me. His whole body looked like it was melting before my eyes unnecessary flesh falling away and reshaping itself. When the transformation was over, he was shorter and squatter. His eyes came out to sharp points. His nose was round and flush, as if he had been out in the cold. Even his clothes had changed to a uniform similar to Santa's companion, only red this time. His new elf appearance was a caricature of his former self. He must have been so scared. Looking down at his new form, he could only let out a pitiful squeak. So was I as I lay frozen underneath the couch clutching the carpet. As that awful, obese man and strange crying elf dragged my newly turned brother into our fireplace, Chris looked down and stared directly at me his expression a desperate cry for help. But what could I do? How could I fight off two magical beings without getting myself into the same horrible situation? So, I did nothing. I still have nightmares about that. With Chris in tow, they shot up the chimney altogether through their strange magic, and that was the last I ever saw of my little brother. For almost the entire night, I stayed under the couch, softly crying. In my state of shock, I had no strength to do much else. But as I saw the sun slowly rising from the windows, I knew it was safe to crawl out of my hiding space and find my way back to my room. The rest, I guess, is history. To this day, I won't have anything to do with this terrible holiday. I don't decorate. I don't give gifts. I don't go to parties. I won't even live in a house with a chimney or fireplace. Hell, I even refuse to visit houses with one this time of year. Don't even get me started about the mall or street corner Santa's. I just keep to my apartment as much as I can. In my paranoia, I really just turned into a cheerless shut-in a month out of the year because I know that somewhere in the world there would be more unlucky children going missing. I still don't know why I didn't meet the same fate as my brother, as he never told his captors that I was there too. Could he really keep a secret for that long? Could they somehow pry 
the truth out of him. Every year since that night, I have been terrified that they'll finally come for me. Perhaps what keeps me safe is the fact that I've stayed quiet all these years, never telling anyone what really happened. I can only presume that Chris has done the same. Anyone out there must be wondering why I'd say anything about it now. To be honest, I want to because I'm not sure what that fat bastard could do to me. I mean, there's no way he could turn a fully grown adult into an elf, right? But most of all, I want to know what becomes of Chris. It hurts to think what could have happened to him over all these years, and I need to find out. Maybe if I share my story with the world, somebody out there will give me answers. Maybe there's some way I could help him. I'm willing to take the risk. I just hope all the disturbing possibilities I've imagined won't come to pass. Christmas Eve is coming. Wish me luck. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a louse. The traps were all set by the chimney with care and hopes that St. Nicholas soon would step there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while nightmares of body parts danced in their heads. And Mama with her hatchet and I with my axe had just settled down for a little nightcap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my chair to see what made the splatter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and ripped through the sash. The moon on the breast of the blood-stained snow gave a hideous glow to objects below. What to my wandering eyes should appear, the watchman was dead with a knife in his ear. There on the lawn knelt a man rather thick. The blood on his coat told me it was St. Nick. More rapid than vultures, he sprang to his feet. This zombified Santa was hungry for meat. Where are the children? I want them now. Bring them down to me, you ugly fat cow. On time and in patience, I've come to your home. I hunger for brains, and I'm not alone. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, a legion of demons flew down from the sky. And up to the housetop, this evil took roost with red beady eyes and a long pointy tooth. And then in a heartbeat I heard on the roof the digging and pawing of each demon roof. As I drew in my hand and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came down with a growl. He was dressed all the hair of the head he had skinned and his clothes were bloodstained from both women and men. With a bundle of cutlery hung around his back, he grabbed for a knife and began his attack. His eyes, they stared through me, his smile freaking scary. His nose was all crinkled like an old rotten cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow. He slashed at my leg and I fell to the floor. The stump of my limb he held tight in his teeth, and the blood seeped from it to white tile beneath. He had a cruel face and some blood in his beard. His expression was empty, for my life I now feared. He was ugly and evil, a sick little elf, and I knew things must change for my kids and myself. With my leg now missing, my wife surely dead, I pushed from the floor and kicked Nick in the head. He spoke not a word and went fell straight on his back, and all the traps sprung just thunderous snap, laying there writhing right where he fell. This bastard passed right through the doorway of hell. 
The demons then vanished, my children were safe. I sat there crying, beginning to faint. But before I passed out, I screamed with all might. Scary Christmas to all and to all a good fright. And this concludes tonight's Horror Christmas Stories. May you all sleep well and have a horrific holiday. Please enjoy the next hour and a half of the relaxing ambience of rain. I'll read to you all soon. Good night.